Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the March 24th, 2022 episode of Java with Josh. Uh, my name is Josh Mason, and thank you for joining me today. Welcome to all of our new joiners, as well as our regular visitors. Today, you get Josh, pilot, cyber warfare officer, INE, red team instructor, consultant, pen tester, web app pen tester. I go by many titles right now. Sales engineer, I do a lot of things. Also a uh, producer here at Cyber Insecurity, and you can catch Cyber Insecurity regularly on Mondays on Twitch with Jack of all trades, Tuesdays with Brent Eskridge right here at 8 p.m. doing a Python course. He did strings last week. I think he's moving on next week on Wednesdays. We have Brandon Krieger who does an AMA at 6 p.m. Obviously, we are here 8 30 a.m. Eastern time. All these are Eastern time. For Java with Josh, you might see more shows coming often tea with a hacker on Friday mornings at 0 8 30 and then at 8 p.m. on Fridays also Jack Reedy back with uh, tipsy cyber we are here to have real conversations to help you get into cybersecurity to grow your career to start your career to learn new things to be a good cyber practitioner we don't have real conversations about the topics that affect our cybersecurity industry enough, the people in it and the companies we protect. So cyber and security, cybersecurity is an ever-changing landscape, and our goal is to focus on multiple aspects of that industry. We will cover red, blue, GRC, engineering, all aspects, sales. I will talk sales and business all day. You're not out of your league on this channel. No matter how many years you have in cybersecurity, no matter your discipline, red, blue, risk governance, doesn't matter. We're here to discuss industry impacts on the current landscape and the art of possible when dealing with today's cybersecurity issues. So whether you're an experienced veteran or new to the field, whether you barely know how to spell cyber or someone who was born in cyber, this stream is for you. All right. We have moderators in chat. I personally thank all the moderators, each and every stream for their dedication. Moderators are here to keep chat safe and free from sexist, racist, misogynistic, elitist, or otherwise toxic behavior. I trust my moderators explicitly and their decision is final. If you are put in a timeout or banned, appeal to them on Discord. They're not here to stifle chat at all. As a matter of fact, the moderators are here to make sure your voices are heard. If you have questions, feel free to throw those in the chat on YouTube. And my great moderator, Chris, will grab those and send them to me in Discord. And I can answer any of your questions. We are going to do a walkthrough of some more INE eLearn Security Penetration Testing Student Labs. So. We'll finish out the Meterpreter Metasploit lab today, get into a little bit of search exploit, how to find vulnerabilities, how to exploit vulnerabilities, um, how to find the exploits that go with the vulnerabilities. That's a big part. And then we'll jump into the black box test one. There are three black box tests in the current PTS. And if you can get through those, you're in really good shape for EJBT. And I say this as the guy working at INE making the next version of EJPT and writing the content and recording the videos for the next version of penetration testing student alongside Alexi Ahmed, otherwise known as Hackersploit. It's been doing all of this for nearly a decade and is really, really good at it. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'll say so. I, I think I do a great job with all of that. If you need to get into the, labs you can hit exclamation point ine and you'll get a link to and this is all, bots only work on youtube if you're not on youtube go find us over there cyber and security youtube if you're on twitch or linkedin i appreciate you watching but i don't have mo enough moderators to grab questions from all those locations so 
if you want all the cool fun stuff we've set it up on youtube jump over there and if you're watching on joshua 17 sc stuff go over to the cyber insecurity uh really i've put all these branches out there to pull people back to what we are trying to do in the cyber insecurity community speaking of the community exclamation point discord we get you a link to our Discord server and you can chat with me and Neil and all of our moderators and the big giant community of thousands of folks who want to help you succeed and get a job in cybersecurity. We were having a conversation last night of who would win the award for having gotten the most cyber and security people into a job with their company. I think Neil's pretty high up there with INE. Uh, Devnil Zen might uh, be a high contender. I know Base is uh, working on some things. Truth be told, we want to see everyone get a job that they want in this community. So come be part of it. All right. If you got that starter pass, you logged into your INE account, then what you should see is something like this. Oh, man. Why is it fuzzy again? I just checked this last night. It's supposed to be good. We'll see if it gets better. Otherwise, I'll have to come up with something. But we've got penetration testing basics. We have been going through this PTS course. It is broken up into three sections, the pen penetration testing prerequisites. We've done most of the labs in there. There's penetration testing preliminary skills and programming. You can do those. They're free. It's a uh, Python, C++, I believe, and some Bash and PowerShell scripting. And it's, it's good. Um, if you don't know how to do any Bash scripting, if you don't know your way around some command line, I'd go check it out. Maybe get comfortable with some Python, but I'll tell you, you don't need to know. You don't have to be an amazing Python or C++ programmer or scripter to pass EJPT or be a hacker. Um, John Hammond was recently on uh, Network Chuck, Chuck Heath's channel and podcast talking about skills. And does it help? Sure, it helps. Um, and I've written some Python. It's out there on GitHub. John's written a bunch of Python uh, that I literally stole. Um, he's cool with it. Um, and you can learn just a little bit of Python. Come to Tuesday nights and probably be good for quite a while. So we are finally on this penetration testing basics. I'll see if it gets any less cloudy, any less fuzzy, but we have this <laughs> Metasploit lab right here. I might stop the share and reshare. See what is going on. Is that any better? That's really not any better. What if I share this one? How annoying. Let's try it one more time. what might be causing the issue. I don't, don't know. I'll see if it can't get any better as we roll. Yeah, I did use my OBS virtual camera last time. So opening up OBS. Give me a second. Do, do, do. There we go. All right. Stop my overshare. Was not set up for this. So give me one second. Yep, 
That's the one. Bubble face. That works pretty well. Let's go over a little. Maybe turn my camera a little. There we go. All right. Uh, now I gotta switch my input here. Hang with me. Hang with me. We will get there. Ta da! Let's go with that one. Cool. <laughs> Thank you, folks, for hanging around. And now we can read it. It's not amazing. I zoom in on here. There. All right. Metasploit Lab. In this lab, you will find and exploit a vulnerable application. It will also cover post-exploitation techniques to extract sensitive information and maintain access. So we're going to set up some persistence, and we're also going to figure out some auto-login. And I say that because it's here in the tasks. We'll identify available services on the target. Footprinting and scanning, we've done that. There was a whole lab covered last week, two weeks ago. This is now like, is this week five or six? Also, been at this for a while. All right, thanks, Chris. Are you in my ear? All right, no, you are, but I'm not talking now, cool. We will find vulnerabilities of the target application, exploit using the Metasploit framework, we'll obtain system privileges on the machine, install persistence backdoor, and extract auto logging credentials. If you are following along at home, you can do all these things. We're just gonna, I'm gonna walk through the vanilla solution just like it says here. That way you can replicate what I'm doing. And if you get stuck, you could pause this, you could look there, you can follow along very easily. Um, it's set out fairly well. I should have started this lab before, my bad. Where's the map? Okay. So we've got our Cali GUI that we will be dropped into for from guacamole. And then we will be attacking demo.ini.local. And we don't know what kind of machine that is. That's exciting. Well, we will find out. So uh, a few things I will talk about since we got like 30 seconds. We're going to utilize the Metasploit framework. And the framework is just that. It is a bunch of modules and different software um, Mm -hmm. yeah, applications that are part of this overall suite. Uh, you've probably heard of like Burp Suite. There are many suites of software that are used in penetration testing. And like I said, uh, Metasploit is one of them. What's great about the Metasploit framework, it is built with Ruby and by what, Rapid7 initially, uh, I think. And then yeah, I think they're the ones who made it, maintain it. I could be wrong. If I'm wrong, someone feel free to throw it in chat um, or in the comments. Let me know. It doesn't much matter. Uh, basically, now there are these modules that are out there and we can use them for scanning, for exploitation, for post-exploitation um, of both APIs, infrastructure, and web apps to do all sorts of great things. Basically, when an exploit comes out, there's a proof of concept. Eventually, someone, in order to automate the testing and um, pen testing, will then create a module that works in Metasploit so that other people can then go and use that module and pen test their, their things. It's pretty great. It usually um, works well. So... That's small. Let's make this bigger. Well, that <laughs> hockey is in guacamole from my Mac. Don't always work so great, but we'll be living in this. So is that like number hanging out over there for everyone or just me? I think it's just me. Go check. Yeah. All right. Cool. So you can read that. All right. Awesome. We know who we are. 
we are 101080.2. That's going to be helpful. 101080.2 or ETH1 is our connection. Now we know that there is a demo.ini.local. Let's just, uh, let's nmap 101080 and check the whole network. It's a 22 instead of a 24. Good catch on that. So fun of cider. We've got the router at dot one and we are dot two and dot. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. It's on a whole different network. 10, four or 26. Very cool. Nmap demo dot ID dot local. Neat. 10426158 is demo.ine.local. We don't, we'll just use the domain. We can use that for everything. We have port 80 open, 135, 139, 445, and 3389. Someone tell me what operating system we're working with. Throw it in chat. Uh, first one to get the right answer gets an Adrian Cantrell, all the things. Um, which. Jack, grab an, or, uh, Chris, grab a name, and I'll send it to them afterwards. If you said, well, let's just do this with aggressive mode on. And it just these ports. Actually, not all of them. 135, 139, and 445. And while that is scanning, we also have... <laughs> saw that there was a port 80 open so let's hit demo.ine.local with nikto why it is an hfs 2.3 server okay and it's going to find some info for us Looks like this came back with the same info. But we see that we're running an HTTP file server, HTTPD 2.3, otherwise known as HFS 2.3. I don't know what that means, but we will find out. And it's looking like Microsoft Windows. And this says probably Microsoft Windows 10. That would have been my bet. Also, <laughs> any other cool information here? Nope, that's fine. But we got a Windows machine hosting this HTTP file server. Let's go check it out. We got port 80 open. Open up your browser. And again, we see HTTP file server 2.3. And it looks like we could log in. There's a home folder. We do some things. It's a file server. It's a web browser based file server. Well, that means you can put files in, you can get files out. Um, I wonder if there's like a vulnerability in there. 2.3, that sounds like an early version. Let's. <laughs> Overshare for a second. Let's check this out. HFS 2.3. Regetto, Regetto, Regetto. I don't know. HTTP file server and exploit DB has an exploit for it. Looks like there's a Git book that talks all about it. Rapid 7's got a Little thing about it. I don't know. Let's dig in. Let's go to exploit DB. Found a service. I Googled the service. First thing that came up with us was an exploit for this service. So that's that's telling. Um, did not know about this Regetto, but it says HFS 2.3. So that's um, that's cool. Point X. We're gonna do another search for that. But core here and oversharing. No. 
looks like this is a Python exploit for remote command execution. What I'm looking for in here is to see like this description. So you can use HFS, the HTTP file server to send and receive files. Okay. It's different from classic file sharing because it uses web technology to be more compatible with today's in internet. Awesome also differs from classic web servers because it's easy to use and runs right out of the box. Hmm. Access your remote files over the network. It's been successfully tested with wine under Linux. Okay. So. Doo, doo, doo. This has some commands and it takes advantage of something. There's a CVE up here. 2014 dash six, two, eight, seven. Let's go check out what that is. Takes us over to the NIST website. Um, you'll be happy to know that we have a full course in the updated PTS covering vulnerability assessment that we dig deep for a couple lessons into the National Vulnerability Database, MITRE, and these base scores for criticality. 9.8 is pretty high up there. The find macro maker function in parserlib.pass in Rejetto HTTP file server, aka HFS, allows remote attackers to execute arbitrary programs via a percent zero zero sequence in a search action. Oh, well, that's not great. There was a, we saw that search, didn't we? Let's pull this up again. There's a search. If you did like a percent zero zero, I don't know, it does something. We could dive deep into this. There are a bunch of explanations in here, but that's not what we're doing. We found a vulnerability. We can exploit the vulnerability. Let's get back into that. So I don't need this guy. Rogetto HFS. So there is a version of exploit DB maintained by oper uh, op offensive security on Kali, which is also maintained by offensive security called search Blade. So if we put in Rogetto and HFS 2.3, it comes up with, hey, the same exploits we just saw. So that's, uh, that's promising. Let's do the same thing without HFS 2.3. Now we can see there is a remote command execution with Metasploit for this Rejetto HTTP file server. That one, um, that leads right into what we want to do. So MSF console. takes us into the Metasploit framework console where we can handle many, many modules. There's exploit modules, there's scanning modules, there are post modules, uh, there's auxiliary modules, encoders, NOPs, evasion, and tons of payloads. You can use MSF Venom, Metasploit framework Venom to create a bunch of payloads, to create a bunch of exploit code if you want to put it into something you're writing a file that you're going to upload or you can just do things through the console where it mashes these exploits and payloads together and runs them and it, it works beautifully all working off of ruby and you get this sometimes beautiful art up here msf nice we'll just search for hfs or let's search for rigid though hey we get one to get some information about this module. This is an exploit module, because it says exploit for Windows, and then dealing with HTTP and the Regetto HFS service. If we wanna know more about this, we can do info, and then we could use this full name, or we can just use that number there on the left. The number is zero, because it's the first one, it's the only one. And it tells us that this works for the Rigetto HTTP file server. The name of the module, platforms for Windows. It's not privileged. Okay, that's good to know. It's licensed by Metasploit. 
It's ranked as excellent. There is a whole ranking of modules from poor to excellent. Excellent means that it usually doesn't take much manipulation and it usually works and it usually doesn't knock over the machine. It's good to know. Thanks, Daniel and Muhammad, for finding this and making this module. All right, then we've got our information. Things that are required in here. Stay required. So we need an R hosts, remote hosts, the target host. We need a remote port. We are it's on port 80. We already checked that with Nmap. There's some other things, the serve port, local port to listen on. That's fine. That doesn't matter. Target URI, the path of the web application in this case. It was hanging out on the homepage, so at the root sounds good. And then what else did it give us? Let's use it. So use zero. It loads it. No payloads configured, so it defaults to Windows, Interpreter, Reverse TCP. That sounds great. And then we want to look at options. So we have what we already saw. We need our hosts. We need our local host. 101082, that is us. So, okay, that works. Uh, it's not always set, so you might have to set that. How do we set things? We say set, and then in this case, our hosts, and you can tab complete. It keeps you from mistyping things, because if you do our host, demo.ini.local, watch this. It's going to say, hey, our host is now set to demo.ini.local. And you're like, okay, I am good to go. So here's the problem. You look at options again, and there is no, oh, okay, well, huh. Should I set that already? No, no, okay. Wow, it got smarter. Okay, it's older versions. It used to be like, no, you didn't set exactly what I wanted you to set. You can set like, set number to 100, and down here, it tells you that it set a variable to a number. doesn't necessarily mean that it worked in your exploit or your payload. But our host did work. So right way to do it. Set our hosts and demo.ine.local. Look at your options again. Everything with a yes has a value to go with it. That works. You can switch up your local port. It's where you're, where it's going to call, call back to. Um, and you'll be listening as the attacker. Uh, quad four is the default for Metasploit. Um, truth be told, it doesn't matter. At some point when you get into evasion, which is far from here, it does matter. Uh, often during a pen test, it really doesn't matter because you'll know what ports you can output things from. Evasion, it all fits into whatever your scope is. There's two things you can do once you're ready to go. You can type run, R-U-N, and that will run your exploit, or you can be elite and say exploit and elite 1337 version of elite. Uh, I know it from the movie Hackers. I'm going to be elite and use exploit. And you can see, started a reverse TCP handler, so we set up a listener. It reached out to the IP, demo.ini.local, set up this thing, start a server. It sent a malicious request. The payload was received. Now it's sending stages. Now it's going to send first stage, which will be the file. And that file will set up a backdoor and start talking back and forth and download things and eventually implant our payload this Windows Interpreter Reverse TCP. Well, Metasploit's doing its thing. I'm gonna check my notes real fast, make sure I didn't miss anything.
usually goes faster than this. All right. Well, that is running. Got some questions. Uh, Kunrin AI got Windows. Nice. Hit me up afterwards in Discord, and I will get you that Adrian Cantrell, all the things. I'll find you, or you can find me either way. California 909 asked, is this Steel Mountain from THM? No, this is, though, though yes, it is very similar. Um, nope, this is the Metasploit Lab from Pen Testing Student on INE. Man. Yeah, it is just like Steel Mountain, though. It's a file server where you exploit a payload and get a reverse shell. In case you're curious, from an external point of view, if you find a web server, especially a file server that is open to external from the network, on any sort of pen testing lab, likely that is your way in. Um, I know I did it with uh, with Tribute. If you look at a couple of uh, Joe Helly's rooms and a few of John Hammond's rooms, it's very common to exploit a web application, a CMS, um, a DevOp uh, platform, or a file share. It's it's the way. This is the way. This is taking a while. Just gonna try something. Ping demo.ind.local, make sure it's still up. It was talking, so yep. Okay, that's good. Just normally it doesn't take this long. Again. Okay, get back to sending that stage. <laughs> so elevated audio incorporated Q asked is L host always ETH zero? No, it's going to be whatever um, interface you're using to connect. So in this situation, it's actually ETH one that 10, 10, 80 dot two. So let's look at our, Connections again. ETH0 for us is on this 10.2 or 10.1. And 10.10, .10, it said, was where we're talking. And let's just confirm that. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. It's not telling us that, but I will tell you for these labs, ETH one is where you're talking to the actual router. Depending on how you're connected, it could be a tap. It could be a tunnel. Um, try hack me often. You're connected to the VPN. So you're usually going to use ton zero. There's some cool things you can do with Metasploit. You can set global variables. Yes. Interpreter session one opened. That's everyone loves hearing that. Um, if you do G set, G set or set G, damn it. Um, one of those, then whatever module you use later, if you change modules, it, whatever you do, as long as you stay within that the console session, that variable will stay the same across different modules and exploits. Okay, so we got a session. Can I can I see it? Oof. Should say interpreter, and we're there, and a thing. Why is it being a pill? Uh, 
I think it's trying to clean up what it sent. Don't need you to clean it up. I just want the session. This is a very this very dirty exploit, and I don't care. I just want in. I want to show the other cool stuff. I don't know. Metasploit does what it wants. Doesn't necessarily listen. And, oh, I'm also going to caveat. This is on a version of the old PTS labs from I, uh, eLearn Security that Pentester Academy has put onto their platform. And it's great that now we have web-based access, but the infrastructure and some of the older bits um, don't always talk nice. I think that they worked really well in 2018 when these labs were first made, but it's been four years. Fortunately, all of the labs in the updated PTS are fresh and new and work really, really great. And instead of one lab for Metasploit, I think Alexi has 14. That Alexi Achmed hackersploit goes through just on the Metasploit framework. So there's going to be a lot. Uh, I'm going to mess up your name, but Summit Coot Q asked, is TriHackMe Premium worth it? It depends. So I bought a year of TriHackMe Premium, and I should check to make sure because I haven't used it in months. Initially, I was on there every day. And if you want to do all of the things on there, then yeah, it's it's not bad, especially for like 10 bucks for a month. Um, if you've done all the free stuff and you're like, okay, I need more, yeah, plunk down 10 bucks. Uh, hang out around here, and you might get like a a year or six months or a free month. We do that a lot. People like donating those and we give them out. When I was had cyber supply drop up and running full speed, we were given a ton of those away. Um, yes, I'm in. Okay. So grab some free ones. Uh, actually, we might be doing a thing with Ben. So stand by for that. Also bug Neil about that. Because I bug him and he's like, yeah, 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 whatever, Josh. But you guys bug him and you might get moving on some things. We are in. We have a Meterpreter session. Meterpreter is the Metasploit interpreter. So Meterpreter. Meterpreter? Meterpreter? I don't know. Uh, what's that? Meterpreter? <laughs> For you cyber and security oldies, you know what I'm talking about with Meterpreter. There you go. So I used get UID and it told me that the server username is attack defense and we are administrator. So that's get the UID, the user ID. If you are a interpreter and you want to know what you can do, just type help. There are so many commands, so many core commands just in here. So you can migrate, you can read stuff, um, you can figure out your sessions. All of your normal file system fun of cat and CD. There's local CD where it's your machine CD in Meterpreter where it's in the victim machine. You got some networking commands. So we'll use IP config later. And these run on the victim. Then there's some greater system commands like get privs. We did get UID. You can kill processes, processes. You can get system info, which we will do in just a second. We will get uh, get PID, do, 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 do. user interface stuff, webcam commands. You can turn on people's webcams and start recording and have it save on your local machine. This is the danger of Metasploit. If you have access to things, you can elevate commands with get system. That sounds cool. Attempt to elevate your privilege to that of the local system. Let's see if that works. Hash dump. You can dump the contents of the SAM database. Timestamp. If you want to manipulate mace attributes. So the times on files, if you change or delete files, now they say that they were modified at a certain time. Well, timestamp allows you to change the time on them. If you're on a Linux machine, you can just, um, what command can you use to change 
I don't know. I used to remember it. I'll look it up if anyone's curious. But timestamp allows you to change Windows and Linux file Mace attributes. So we saw there was one called Get uh, Get System. Let's uh, we'll let's start out. Make sure that we are on the machine that we think we're on. We are on a Windows 2016 Plus server. It's a x64 architecture. We have an x86 interpreter shell. We could upgrade that if we wanted. Meter name is called Attack Defense, and I like to check sysinfo, user ID, and PID when I land on a machine with a interpreter shell. The PID is 80, 18, 20, and we can check PS for processes. That PID of 18, 20 tells us that we took over exe, which is a file that we uploaded and ran because it's a file server. And you can do those things because it has that exploit, that vulnerability that we took advantage of. Now, a neat thing that we can do now that we're in, so it's saying that we're running as attack defense administrator, which is probably the user who is logged in hosting the file server. And that's cool, but look at this one, NT authority system. So for those who don't know Windows, there is... There's users, there's administrator users, and then there's what the machine itself can do. The operating system, it's called system. System is the highest. A person can't be system. You can only ever be an administrator, and you can ask system to do things for you in Windows. One of the cool things about Meterpreter is we can become system. There's other ways you could do it. Meterpreter is not like special. It just makes it easy for you. But um, there's hot potatoes and all sorts of great ways to become system uh, on a Windows machine as an attacker, if it's possible. What I like to do is migrate to another service that is not our weird thing.exe. Because from a um, forensic standpoint, that's pretty obvious. That's like, oh, hey, I'm an attacker and I put a weird file on your ser server. Also, um, I'm walking around looking like administrator and if administrator is logged in, they might see some of the things we're doing. I like this win log on other people have different opinions about not being win log on, but usually here's one of the cool things. Meterper takes over whatever service you just like you're running, whatever process you are in, you are in that, uh, in that process. So when you look at the memory capabilities of what you want to do with Meterpreter, you're stuck with whatever memory capabilities are available for that process. When logon starts at Windows logon, and initially it, it takes as much as it can, knowing that once someone's logged in and their system's up and running, it, it maintains there, but it doesn't use much. So it has this huge capability of RAM, of processing power, but it's not using it. So we can use it. So I like to migrate to win logon. And that in this case is 692. So we will type migrate. I just started typing it. It took me to the bottom. 692. And migration was complete. You can't always migrate, but this one is made to. Uh, so let's check our UID now. I didn't even have to privilege escalate. I just migrated into something and now I am system. Another cool thing we could have done is get system. I think since I'm already system, yeah, not going to do anything. The directions have you just type get system, but I like my migrate way better because now we're hidden. We are now 692. We're system. We're running as win logon and we have tons of capability, which is kind of neat. Uh, is that a question for me, California? VB meaning virtual box? Uh, the Flying Jets has a question. How many boxes are in EJPT? And I can't tell you that because that is literally, that might or might not be a question in EJPT. Samson Pavlov asked, have I ever used Metasploit Pro? I have not. I've heard it's a pretty decent C2 for sharing amongst people. Um, if you're going to go that route, Cobalt Strike is pretty much a version of that. Uh, 
And if you're the sort of person who's using a C2, usually the organization can afford it. And Elevated Audio Incorporated asked again, uh, how do you know what process you're running? Uh, get PID. And I can scroll uh, too far, too far, too far. See, I did get PID of 1820. And then when I ran PS, which is the process list, I scrolled down and saw this weird file. Now this weird file, GYK TIABB, if I go all the way up to when I first jumped into this machine, you can see, is it here? I was trying to see if it was one of the files that we uploaded. It's probably a file in this weird named thing. Weird name directory. Does much matter. It's made to obfuscate and be different each time. Basically, it looks funny. And you can see where it's hanging out is in a strange place. Most services don't run in strange places. They run in like Windows System 32. Oh, these are kicked off by Windows System 32. So even that, that's pretty obvious. Here is the other one that I tried to upload and run. Again, it's in a weird place. Not launched by SVC host. Not run by something that makes sense. Sorry, there, path. So, yeah, stick with things that make sense. Like that are in Windows System 32. Because Easy Forensics is doing a lot of work and processing power as a, a process that doesn't initiate from Windows System 32. Okay. We are now then. So we want to do some privilege. Es uh, well, I did privilege escalation. That was pretty easy, actually. You can do get system rather than the migrate. I like migrating. Two birds with one stone. Also, sometimes get system doesn't work, so you have to migrate and then get system anyways. We are going to set up a persistence system. So we put a file out there and it called back to us. And it was set up like it triggered, like it used that HFS, the percent zero zero vulnerability to actually run that file because it could upload it and then it ran the file and that's what reach back out to us. Let's set up something that sits out there and is constantly running that will reach back out to us anytime we want to come back to this machine. So we don't have to fully exploit it again. That's what uh, persistence is. And we can background this guy. You can type background. You can type control Z. It backgrounded it to session two. If you take sessions, tech I, We've got these two sessions. And also this upgraded to an X64 because I moved into a 64-bit process. A little more processing power as well. Or capabilities, rather. We want to search for persistence. There's a lot of persistence modules, 22 of them. We want a Windows persistence module. And we want a persistent service. So exploit Windows local persistent service. It's excellent. Let's check it out. Let's use 17. So options and this one, it's based off of session. So you have to have an active session already in order to use this. It doesn't work as a initial vector for exploitation. It'll retry a few times. And we already have it set up to talk back to us. Let's set the L port to clean just a little different uh, 9001. 9001. You can do whatever you want. Show uh, and set 
session to two. Options. All the yeses are filled in. Let's run. So it started a reverse handler on 9001. It ran the module against attack defense. The service was created, did some cleanup. It sent the stage. And now session three was opened. And we are now in session three, which is cool and all. We can run it and <laughs> we're in. Let's background this guy. Look at all of our sessions. We've got three of them. We're going to kill all of our sessions. Bye. We check them, no active sessions. You're like, no, but you worked so hard to get that interpreter session. That is fine. We're going to use exploit multi handler. This is like a net cat handler, a sets up an open um, listener and we can tie it to a payload. In this case, it went with generic shell reverse TCP and that one's okay. But what I want is the interpreter one. Set payload to Windows. Interpreter forward slash reverse TCP. And then options. Cell host. L port. Remember, I set it to 9001. Options. We're going to now listen on our local CI. I put uh, ETH1 and it filled in 101080.2. That's kind of money, right? 9001, and let's run that guy. And it starts listening. It's like, oh, hey, hey, something's calling out to us. And we have a session. And if I background it, showing you all the ways you type background, BG, Control Z, they'll work. Session stack I. Now we have a new session. I could I could do that whole thing again. Um, session dot K, kill it. Check no sessions. Run my exploit again, or my handler, and I'm back in with a new session. Session five now. Pretty cool, huh? That is persistence. Persistence is a great if you're ever in an unstable situation and um, you're like, your connection keeps dropping. If you exploit something and then like your connection drops and then you exploit something and then your connection drops, like throw in a persistence on there. And then if you're, it drops, you can just hit run again on your handler and it's back up. I like it. But now let's get our PID. We are at 3352. And if we get our UID on this, okay, we're back to system. Yay. Um, that's because I set up the uh, persistence when I was system. So the file was running as system, which kind of makes it nice. Look at PS3352 is what it called us. It's this weird named thing. That's fine. Um, we could migrate just to make it look better. Talks about a explorer.exe. I don't see a running explorer.exe. Maybe it'll just open one. Migrate attack N. And you can name it explorer.exe. And there's explorer. Okay. That one's running as administrator, so let's see. Yeah, it downgraded us to administrator. But now if we check our PID, we are still explorer. Again, hidden. That's helpful. Um we get system. I found a named pipe for impersonation, and we are now system. Yes, that's awesome. 
So named pipes are known mm, connections, pipes, for, for services to talk to one another. So finding a named pipe is like, there's this, there's a whole bunch of pipes that are named. Um, it's like uh, a Martin Luther King Boulevard in a big city. Like there's always a street called Martin Luther King Boulevard for good reason. Um, sometimes there's like all, often a MacArthur Boulevard also for fairly good reasons or finding um, a city named Washington in a state. They exist all over the place um, for good reason. Well, there's named pipes. Uh, this is less just because of like that naming convention, but it's common. Developers can set things up utilizing a named pipe, knowing that it's probably going to work if they send data through a named pipe. So our exploit can look for a named pipe and see, hey, is there something that's a service that's just listening for things? Yes, in this case, there was. Um, it found a named pipe that it could use for impersonation, and now we are system. And let's double check. Eddie. Yeah, we're still explore. So that's kind of cool. Okay. The other thing we wanted to get was an auto login. You turn on your Windows machine and you maybe have it set up so it automatically goes to your desktop. Even if you have a username and password, sometimes you might have it configured where it doesn't ask for those the first time. How does it know? Well, it stores your username and password. And depending on how you might have things configured or misconfigured, it might be in plain text. So we're going to use something that's looking for that auto login in plain text. So I'm going to background this guy and search auto login. We have that post number one. Let's use number one. It's for windows. It gathers credentials on a windows auto login and over in the description, windows gather auto login user credential extractor. That sounds pretty tough for us. Options. We just have to set a session. We were in session five. So set session five and run. It ran and it came up with a password, a username and default username, default password, administrator and hello attack defense. So now we have those. And if we wanted to log in, now we have the username and password for administrator. And that is the Metasploit lab. Um, I went way more in depth than I probably should have. Uh, got kind of deep. It is almost 930 and the black box lab is going to be a little longer. I'm going to start it. I'm going to take a look and see about starting it. Do you guys have any questions about what we did here? Which is my normal ask at the end of a lab. And should we do another giveaway? Who else wants to be a AWS architect? Adrian Cantrell, great guy. He is a AWS instructor and AWS architect himself out of Australia who put together a whole course. The all the things combo pack that he has is all of his courses and any course that he ever builds and you have lifetime access. It's you're going to kick me. Okay, fine, fine, fine. We already did one giveaway. Well, that we're, we're good for the day. <laughs> All right, Black Fox Pen Test 1. Let's just take a look. and We can get it started. <laughs> fair point, fair point. Thanks, man. In this environment, we have... We don't know what we have. That's the fun thing. That's why it's called a black box test. Everything else we knew, we were attacking this many machines in this environment. And the objective is to compromise both machines to retrieve the flags. So we know there are two machines. That's kind of all we know. 
You can go through the solution if you want. I'm basically going to walk through the solution, but um, I'm going to do it as if I didn't know what the solution was. How's that sound? Which is really hard for me because I know all these solutions. It's literally my job. <laughs> all right. Make this a little bigger. All right. IPA, we are 192.127.206.2, and we will end map that. If you don't know the highlight and center click on your mouse, it copies and pastes whatever you have highlighted. It's a great Linux feature. And we know that there is a demo.ind.local ching on the dot three and it's got port 80 open and 3306 a mysql server uh dot 80 open let's go check it out demo.ini.local see what's running vcms vcms a complete open source simple cms powered by vcms version 1.0 well that's awesome uh Cool. Gonna nicto tech host demo.ini.local. And while that's running, nicto is a web vulnerability scanner. Elevated audio asked, although you set up persistence, it seems like you have a new random PID each time you start a new session. Requires you to migrate each time to escalate to system. No, there's uh, because of how we set it up, if once you have that persistence mechanism, when it pulls you back in, then you're going to be running a system because I set up persistence when I was system. Does that make sense? So the, the service that is running that, you know, reaches out to our Kali machine or that is like, yeah, it's reaching out to our Kali machine. It's running a system. So when I like answer it with my handler, then I show up as system. I am running as a strange program. And then for the sake of following the lab, I migrated to Explorer, but Explorer was running as administrator because it was opened by the administrator who was on the machine. So administrator being like a, a user service um, tied to the application, it only had the privileges of that user. So many services run in the background as system and they make your computer work, especially as a, well, yeah, as a Windows machine. So we take advantage of that. So to become system, I didn't need to migrate. I migrated for the to follow the lab. Um, I like to migrate to win logon to hide and usually because it automatically makes me system. And if it doesn't make me system, Often I can get system as that service in a lot of capture the flags. I don't know about real life. I, I hope people are configuring things better than that, but we would find out. And then there's many, 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 many ways of getting persistent, uh, privilege escalation. Um, Alexi has some great videos. John's got some great videos. I've got some videos uh, and there's, Try Hackmes and PTP has a whole bunch and it's going to have even more. It's going to be crazy. Post exploitation. Um, I know Alexi did a bunch in PTS. What he has planned for PTP is going to be amazing. I think he's going to do that one. I'm going to do some web app um, working on social engineering. Now social engineering labs going to make some beef, some go fish, some set, Kiss curious what I do when I'm not live streaming. So we have this VCMS. It's running on Engine, uh, Nginx 1.14. We can go take a look. The, the browser inside your machine doesn't reach out to the world. 
but we know that there's this VCMS 1.0. So let's check out VCMS 1.0. 1.0, oh, <laughs> it auto-filled in exploit. So it really wants to do this. VCMS arbitrary PHP file upload and execution in Metasploit. That was easy. Let's check out the CVE. Unrestricted file upload vulnerability in includes inline images. In the AutoSec tools, VCMS 1.0 allows remote attackers to execute arbitrary code by uploading a file with an extend, executable extension, then accessing it via a direct request to the file in temp. All right. Well, that is not great. Uh, when something is a 1.0, often they weren't thinking, aren't thinking. That's why they hired people like Chris to make sure it doesn't suck. It's also from 2011. So that's why SAS and DAST are very important. Well, we just saw what we got to do. We got a Metasploit module. So MSF console. Let's play this first machine and we can do that. Yeah. In the next couple of minutes, theoretically. I did tech Q. It opens it without all the boisterous stuff at the top of your Metasploit. And clear, put that at the top. Search for V CMS. And there's a normal. Okay, great. No, I don't want that. I want this upload. And, oh, hmm, Linux. Do you think it's Linux? I think it's Linux because it's running Nginx. I mean, you could run that on Windows, but you, you didn't. Let's just do a quick aggressive on demo.ine.local. Number 80. All that warm fuzzy that we're running Linux. I'm going to use one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we got PHP session IDs. It's engine X 1.14. I could probably look it up, but it says it's running a Linux 4.0. All right, yay, warm fuzzy achieved. Thanks, Chris. I'm going to exploit this and then I'll call it good. Then I'll start from there next time. So. Our host, it needs part 80 is good. Target URI. It looks like the VCMS is running on the homepage, so on root. So we'll change that. So let's set our hosts to demo.ine.local. Set target URI to root. It's listening on uh, set L host. Let's do set G L host. Eth one and L port works. Let's check the options one last time. Did that actually work. Eth one. Okay, so it's edgy. Good. Run it. And it's reaching out. Hmm. Eth1 is the 192. When I scan, but it put in 10.106. Let's Why is it changing my
Why is it changing? I guess that's right. Okay. Okay. Don't try the weird set G thing. Just set L host as the right one. That's why it wasn't working right. But now we have an interpreter session. We'll do what we normally do. What are the three things that we do when we get an interpreter session? Sysinfo, make sure we're on the right machine. All right, we're on a Linux machine. Awesome. Call demo.ine.local. That is always good. Check. Check our UID. We are root. Awesome. Check our PID, 577 and PS. And it really doesn't seem to matter. We're Nginx. Okay. But we're root. So that's awesome. Uh, let's go to root. Look around. And there is a flag at the flag. And tab completion doesn't work with an interpreter. But boom, got the root flag. Awesome. You could also download flag.txt. This is cool. And then we could do LLS, which is a local LS, and our machine. And I got that flag.txt. And it's 33 bytes. If we check LS, again, 33 bytes. It's the same file. Pretty cool way to download files with an interpreter. I didn't need to get system one because we're not windows and we're already root. So get system doesn't really work. That's a flag. I could check the configurations on here. HP Linux. Much fewer commands. That's fine. I could change some things if I really wanted to. Sorry. We'll just drop into a shell. Dropping into a shell is dangerous and it can make a lot of noise. Kids are opening a new session. Uh, less dangerous on Linux than it is on uh, Windows. But We've got a simple shell like bin bash. Let's do that. Hmm. Don't want to give me anything super useful. Why not? That's fine. I have config. We can see that this machine is running on ETH zero and an ETH one. And it's this 192.127.206.3. That we attacked just to double check all that. Yeah, 206.3 is who we attacked, and we were 206.2. So it's on the 206, it's also on this 109.2. And that, that is fun. And we will do some pivoting onto that. I don't know. Let's just do it now. <laughs> It'll be fun. So uh, do, 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 to get back out of this, let's let's background. Uh, let's yeah. Background. Z. Back into interpreter. We're going to do something called auto root. 
and it's going to right. It's a module that we will use to root through this first machine into the next machines. Look at the help page and you set it up and you've got your the subnet and the subnet mask of what you want to root to. So in our situation, we would want to add the root <laughs> this 241.109 to our table. So I don't like to mistype things. So I'm going to do is that dot zero and our mask is going to be it's a dot it was a side of 24 so 255.255.255.0 it really wants me to run this post auto route and then the options whatever it worked so added route via R206.3. So that's kind of the neat thing that you can do. So then we can background interpreter and then check our, our routing table. And now we have access to this 109 through session one. And that's kind of the cool thing. So now we could do a port scan through there, but I think we just, can we just end map? We'll use this. We'll use auxiliary scanner, port scanner and TCP. And options. We check all ports. Let's just check all ports. That's fine. Or Yeah, we'll do that. There are our hosts to 192.241.109. Then dot, <laughs> what do I want to use? Let's go with three to 10. Go with one to 10. Well, now we knew this machine was dot two, right? It's this 109.2. So 109.1 is probably the gateway. And so it's probably anything greater than that. So let's go with three. Three to 10. Options and run. They came up with port 22 and port 21 on this dot three as open. And that's promising. Port 21 being FTP, 22 being SSH. We could probably play with that. 49. We will come back to this next week. But uh, I'm going to end it here. That way there's enough time. If you wanted to jump into first things first, Chris can get back to work. I can make my next meeting. And uh, we don't run into any issues. So... We will follow up on this. We found port 22 and 21 through our auto route. Um, and we will play with that again next week. So we'll finish up this lab and we'll jump into black box two. Um, that one will probably go faster and hopefully black box three will go even faster as we start making or noticing some similarities and differences. All right. With that, thank you for joining us. If you want to follow the, continue this conversation, throw in an exclamation point, Josh, and you will get all of my socials, connect with me wherever you want, follow me, DM me. I don't care. If you've got a good question, we will talk. If you're going to be annoying, whatever, we'll still talk. That's fine. Um, I throw it out there and accepting all things. Um, jump into discord, exclamation point, discord, and join the cyber and security discord channel um, or server and have great conversation with all these other people and our mods and the rest of the team. Um, 
with that, you have a great rest of your day and uh, enjoy the rest of the shows with, on cyber and security and the shows today. Like first things first, uh, Outpost Gray with Jack Scott. Uh, Jerry has his stream at 4.30. I know Bass and I will be all over there on that. With that, have a great week and goodbye. Oh, right. I have a virtual camera. Goodbye.